As the children are leaving, there should be some seats opening up for folks. Let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and open them to Genesis chapter 37 and verse 5. Seeking to cover this morning verses 5 through 11. The title of our message this morning is The Importance of Vision. The Importance of Vision. Maybe better titled, The, the Importance of a Vision. We are continuing our movement through the book of Genesis. You'll notice there we've got the fourth man underlined, Joseph. Um, he is now the focus of the remaining 14 chapters of the book of Genesis that we have been studying. Genesis is pretty easy to understand in terms of an outline. You've got four events, Genesis 1 through 11, four people, Genesis 12 through 50. The four events, Genesis 1 through 11, are creation, fall, flood, national dispersion, and then the four people are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It was through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the nation of Israel was born, very important nation because through that nation, God obligated himself to bless the world. So we have all been blessed because of Israel not the least of which is the Savior who has come into the world through the nation of Israel. But now that nation has to be preserved, preserved from famine, preserved from cultural decay in Eden. And the man that God is going to use for this preservation is this man named Joseph. God is going to begin to deal with Joseph as a very young person, age of 17, and he is going to have no idea what's going on in his life. His life won't even make any sense until age 30. But through it all, God says to Joseph, trust me, I'm going to do through you a great thing. And I largely think that's God's message to us as we're now moving into a new year. There are things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. But God says, I want you to trust me through it because I'm going to do something great in and through your life. It's a lot like um, someone picks you up at the airport and drives you to where you're supposed to go. You don't have to no, particularly if you're in some other, some area that you're unfamiliar with, you don't have to know every turn, you don't have to know every street address. Uh, all you have to do is trust the character of the person doing the driving, because it's kind of assumed that they know what they're doing. And if they don't know what they're doing, you should probably get another driver. But as long as they know what they're doing, I don't have to understand the route and the map and everything. That's sort of what the walk of the believer with God is like. He takes us through different twists and turns, and we're always saying why, what, all these questions that we have. But at the end of the day, God says, just trust my character and trust my knowledge. I'll, I'll get you to where you need to go. And that's what's going to happen in the life of this young man named Joseph, we are first introduced to Joseph. Uh, we, actually, we saw his birth earlier. But now he becomes center stage in Genesis chapter 37. That's our, really our major introduction to the life of Joseph. And you can take Genesis 37, which we're working our way through, and divide it into four parts. Joseph's coat, we saw that last week, verses 2 through 4. 
Joseph's dreams, verses 5 through 11. We're going to see those right now. Next week, Joseph's pit, verses 17 through 24. And then the chapter ends with Joseph's enslavement into Egypt, setting the stage for what God wants to do through Joseph and ultimately through the nation of Israel. Joseph's coat, we looked at that last week, how his father Jacob gave him a special coat. It kind of gave Joseph, or made him feel like, I would think, the rights of the firstborn when Joseph, in fact, was not the firstborn. He was the eleventh born. And that created great jealousy on, on account of his brother's And if that weren't enough, here in verses 5 through 11, we see Joseph's dreams. Two dreams are given to Joseph when he is a 17-year-old. We have another reason for the hatred of the brothers toward Joseph, these dreams. They actually are going to give him a nickname, the dreamer. Verse 5, then you have the first dream, verses 6 through 8, and then the second dream, verses 9 through 11. But notice, first of all, this dreams that he starts to have, which is another reason, adding kind of fuel to the fire of the brother's hatred against this 17-year-old Joseph. Notice, first of all, verse 5, it says, then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Notice the first part of this, Joseph um, had a dream. This is really a very interesting study in Scripture, how much God chose to give his word to us through people having dreams. Uh, If you just did a study in the Bible on dreams, uh, it would be a really comprehensive, exhaustive type of study because God, in his word, is giving people dreams constantly. And those become the source of Scripture. Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar said to his wise men, "Um, don't just interpret the dream for me, but tell me what the dream was. How would you like him for a boss? Oh, and by the way, if you don't do it, I'm going to cut your head off. (laughs) Nice Monday morning at work there. And, of course, none of them could cough up the right dream or the right interpretation except God gave the solution to Daniel. And that was a revelation, Daniel 2, of a time period that we actually are still living in now called the times of the Gentiles, where the nation of Israel would be trampled down by various Gentile powers. Uh, Very significant time period, all revealed in a dream. Matthew chapter 27, verse 19. Remember, Herod, excuse me, Pilate didn't want anything to do with the crucifixion of Jesus initially. He washed his hands. Why did he do that? He did that because of a dream that his wife had. Matthew 27, verse 19, it says, While he, that's Pilate, was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man, Jesus, in his execution. In other words, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. So dreams, it's interesting, are replete throughout the scripture, and God used the different dreams of people that he sent as part of divine revelation to us. Now, I don't know if that's some kind of formula that I'm supposed to analyze my dreams. A lot of times I, can't, I wake up very alive and alert because I was involved in a dream of some kind. I just can't remember what the dream was. But at the time I was sleeping, it was very real to me. So I'm not sure if we need to be paying attention to our dreams in the same way. I hope not, because some of my dreams are totally weird. (laughs) 
But just understand that God gives dreams, and he gave to those involved in Scripture dreams, and those dreams are recorded, and this is how so much of God's plan is revealed to us and disclosed to us. You notice in verse 5, then Joseph had a dream. Now, he was 17 years old. Verse 2 indicates that. What God is doing in this dream is he's showing Joseph a vision of his life when he's very, very young. And that becomes extremely important to him because there's going to be a lot of tossing and turning and difficulty and adversity. And as long as he keeps his eyes on the vision, he can fulfill God's purpose. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18 says where there is in the King James Version, where there is no vision, the people perish. And how, how important that is to have a vision for your life. Not a vision that comes from you, but comes from God somehow. And I'm not here to argue that every person is going to have their own personal vision or direct dream from God. But I do believe that God is in the vision of showing people through different circumstances what he wants to do through their life. I remember when I was very young, I preached a sermon. My pastor at the time was sick in the little Baptist church that I was attending. And I praise the Lord for the fact that this sermon was recorded before the days of the internet because I have no idea what I said and I don't know if you'd want to know either. But I remember preaching that sermon. I remember feeling the, the presence of the Lord. And I remember saying to myself, wow, this, this would be neat to do this on a regular basis. Be a, be a teacher, be a preacher of the word of God. And other people sort of confirmed, you know, the gifting that I had. And what God was doing in my life, this would be about the age of 22, is he was sort of giving me a vision was not an audible voice, it was not uh, some kind of ray of light, anything like that, but sort of a vision of the direction that he wanted for my life. And so as I began to discover that, I began to make choices consistent with that vision. This is why having, having a vision, having a direction, what, what are the desires of my heart that God has given me that he wants to bring forward? Having that is so significant because it keeps you on the straight and narrow when life will throw you curveballs, as in the case of Joseph. I remember when Curtis Bowers was here. Uh, he spoke at our church not long ago, and we've had him as a guest before. And I remember he said something very interesting to me in the parking lot on the way out the first time we had him here. He said, try to, try to give the young people in your church some kind of vision for their life. Try to encourage them to go to God for some sort of vision for what he wants to do in and through them because so many of the youth are sort of wandering aimlessly. They don't really know why they're here. They don't really know why they exist, even in the, the Christian world. They, they haven't really gone to God to get his will for their lives. And I don't, I don't think there's any shame in going to God frequently and saying, Lord, here I am. What do you want to do with my life? I know you've wired me a certain way. We all have different gifts, talents, abilities, temperaments all given from God, and God, this is all yours. You gave all of this to me. What, what would you have me to do in the course of my life? And the vision that he gives for my life would be different than the vision he gives for your life. And it would be different than the vision that he gives relative to the person sitting next to you, their life. But having that is so significant. And the Lord says, you have not because you what? You ask not. Ask the Lord. And it's a great time of the year to do this as we're beginning a new year. Lord, what's your vision for 2024? What, what's your vision for Sugarland Bible Church? What's your vision for my life? And this actually is what God here is giving to Joseph at a very early age in the form of a dream. 
you see some, I would call it naivety on the part of Joseph because he immediately shares it with his brothers. It says, verse 5, then Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Now, we learned last week that they already hated him. Verse 4, they couldn't even speak to him on friendly terms. He's 17 years old. He's not really mature in the, the ways of the world. And so he probably shared this vision thinking that they would think it was wonderful. But it actually became the basis for them hating him even more. You know, Jesus talked about don't cast your pearls before the swine. In other words, when God gives you something special, uh, be, be careful about who you share that with. Have some discernment about that because not everybody out there necessarily has your best interest at heart. They may react in a way that you did not suspect, which is what I think is happening to Joseph here in his naivete. You see the reaction of the brothers, it says. That's the other 11 of Jacob's dozen. They hated him even more. So now they have another reason to hate him. They hated him, verse 2, already because he kind of went to Jacob, the father, when they stepped out of line. They didn't like him for that reason. These brothers also didn't like Joseph because Jacob sort of favored Joseph. And that was compounded with the gift of this very special coat which seemed to indicate Joseph's elevation over the other brothers. And now that he is having these dreams, he shares those probably out of naivete, thinking that they're going to be really thrilled with <laughs> these visions. And that compounds the problem, and this is why his brothers wanted to get rid of him. This is this growing hatred, growing resentment, and why Joseph, they sold him as a slave, as we're going to learn at the end of the chapter, down into Egypt. So Christian, don't be shocked as you begin to walk with the Lord. Don't be shocked if the world doesn't stand up and applaud. Uh, Joseph's brothers didn't stand up and applaud. His own family, talk about family friction, his own family did not stand up and applaud. Joseph is favored, and yet he's rejected by his brothers. As Christians, we are favored by the Father. God is on your side. You are loved and adored by the Father. We kind of share these things with others, thinking that they're going to be happy for us. But if they're not Christians, they have no framework for rejoicing. And they oftentimes will come against us. Jesus, in fact, warned us about this in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love, love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you." Why does the world hate the Christian? The answer is the Christian mar marches to a different drumbeat than the world system. The world system, orchestrated by Satan himself, has a completely different value system. And when we begin to walk with the Lord through our progressive sanctification in the middle tense of salvation, we oftentimes have a tendency to provoke the wrath of the world. People start to come against us and we don't understand why. And yet Jesus told us why. The reason that you are such an irritant in the world is because you're marching to a different drumbeat. You're marching to a different value system. That, by the way, I think is one of the reasons we are called salt and light in our culture. Think about what light does when you're in darkness and someone turns on a light switch. Think about how annoying that is to the eyes initially when you're accustomed to darkness. 
Or think about what salt does. You put salt in a little tiny wound and it, boy, does it sting. And so your presence in the world is doing those things to the unsaved. And that's why they're not necessarily behind us, why many times they come against us, just like they did Joseph. And I bring this up because many times the world comes against us in some way, at the office, at the job, in the family, and we think we're outside of God's will. But the truth of the matter is we could be directly in God's will and these things could be happening. John the Apostle described the world system. He says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Don't fall in love with the present world system. It's on its way out. That would be like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And beyond that, it has a totally foreign value system than yours as a Christian. So we are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 calls us ambassadors. What, what does an ambassador do? Well, if I'm America's ambassador to Iran, I'm not there for regime change. I'm not there to lead a political revolution. I'm there to represent American values in a culture, Iran, that doesn't accept or embrace Christian values. That's how we are in this world. We're not here for regime change. That's why you don't hear a lot of sermons or any sermons for that matter from this pulpit about how we're building the kingdom and bringing in the kingdom. We're not going to be hosting conferences here, the Kingdom Builders Conference, because we understand where we are in the outworking of of God's plan for the ages. We're living in Satan's turf, Satan's territory, God has us here for a season to be salt and light, not typically accepted by the world system. And one of these days, there is going to be regime change. When he comes back in his second advent and rules for a thousand years, that's your regime change. But it's something that he will orchestrate, not us. And so we have to have this understanding as Christians as why we are out of sorts with the world. When I first became a Christian, about the age of 16, it was probably one of the most difficult years of my life because I started facing a bunch of adversity. And I thought to myself, well, why is God allowing this? But in reality, fortunately, I had very good disciplers. They told me, you're exactly where God wants you. In fact, this is natural for the Christian. And uh, this is what's happening with Joseph. He has these dreams. He's thrilled. And he, in sort of naivete, casts his pearls before the, the swine. And they come against him. Their anger grows to the point where they're actually, as we continue on in the chapter, willing to commit murder. So... What were these dreams? The first dream is given in verses 6 through 8, and the second dream is given in verses 9 through 11. Let's take a look here at the first dream. Notice the introduction, verse 6. He said to them, Joseph speaking to his brothers, please listen to this dream which I have had. Now, the Hebrew word for listen is shema. Shema. That's a really important word It's listen up. In fact, there's a very famous set of verses in the Bible that go by the title Shema, the Hebrew Shema. If you say Shema to a Jewish person, they they, they know what verses you're talking about. They're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, where God says, listen up. 
And it's very interesting because it's in the context of the family and rearing of children. Hear Israel, that's Shema, same word that Joseph is using. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Close quote. Shema, listen up, Israel. I'm going to teach you how to raise up the next generation. And that involves a very important element called time. As you're with your children, as you rise up, when you lie down, when you sit, when you walk, it's talking about all hours of the day. You're with them. You're transmitting to them during teachable moments truth and the things of God. And I understand economics and the pressure of it, making it difficult for parents to do this today, but the principle is still the same. You are the primary transmitter of spiritual truth to your children. And if they're not going to learn it from you, either through role modeling, teaching, watching how you handle different things in life, if they're not going to learn it from you, you cut a, the cord of a major transmission that God intends as spiritual truth flows from one generation to the next. There's some frightening words um, in the book of Judges. Judges' generation followed the Joshua generation. It says there, early Judges, there arose a generation that did not know God, nor the things that God had done for Israel. They had no knowledge of the Exodus event. They had no knowledge of the conquest of Canaan, how exactly it was conquered. They had no knowledge about the miracle that God did with Jericho, the Jordan River. And I think what happened is the parents just got busy. They're probably doing a lot of good things but they got too busy for their primary responsibility of teaching, role modeling, presenting Christian truth to the next generation. And so I think God to us today in the year 2024 is saying, listen, Shema, pay attention to this. Become what God has called you to become as a parent, as a grandparent in the year 2024. 24. So Joseph to his brother says, listen, Shema, I, I want to I wanna tell you sort of in his naivety about these dreams that he has had. And then he narrates the first dream, verse 7. For behold, we, that's me and the other 11, were binding sheaves in the field and lo, my sheaf, sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. No wonder they didn't like him. What, what is this, this speaking of? It's a prophecy. It's a vision that God gave to Joseph about what would happen in his life. And it's a prophecy that really would not find fulfillment for another 13 years. It's not until Joseph hits age 30 that this prophecy is fulfilled. And this becomes the importance of the vision because he has to cling on to this truth because there's going to be a lot of twists and turns as we're going to study. But God says, trust me. Some way... Somehow, this vision will be fulfilled because these sheaves, the 11, refer to something. And the sheaf that stood up refers to something as well. This is what we call reference behind the symbol. What these symbols signify is not left to one's own private imagination. 
you don't have to come to this with your own sanctified imagination and say, well, that sheaf means the United States and this sheaf means Cuba or whatever interpretation you want to come up with. That's, all you have to do is let the Bible explain itself because the Bible is its own best interpreter. So we're going to have the reference explained in just a minute. But I want to make you aware that this is a prophecy that is a short-term prophecy in the sense that it's going to be fulfilled 13 years later. You're not going to have to wait thousands of years as in the case of some prophecies for this prophecy to happen. This is going to happen in your lifetime. It's like Jesus uh, in the upper room with the disciples on Passion Week, just before his death. John 13, verse 19, I think it is, and John 14, verse 29. He says, I'm going to tell you these things in advance that are going to come to pass so that when they come to pass, you'll know that I am he. And he tells them how he's going to die, who's going to betray him, and he's, how long he's going to be in the grave, when he's going to come up out of the grave. He starts to talk about things that are going to happen about uh, 40 years late, uh, excuse me, 40 days later, following his resurrection, where the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on the newborn church on the day of Pentecost. And what Jesus is doing is he's giving these disciples, most of whom are going to go out and suffer martyrdom. Every single one of them is going to die of unnatural causes, except John. John was stubborn because he wouldn't die. They kept trying to boil him to death in oil. He wouldn't die. So Domitian said, enough of this. Put him out on the island of Patmos. And John, probably on the island of Patmos, said, I guess God is finished with me. No, you're about to get the book of Revelation. God has you out on Patmos for a purpose. But at any rate, these men went to their deaths because they had a vision for what God was doing as confirmed through short-term prophecy. If any of the predictions that Jesus had made in the upper room failed to come to pass, they would have wavered in their faith and confidence and they would not have died such horrific deaths to glorify Jesus. This is the, the power of vision as presented in short-term prophecy. There's a wonderful book on this that I recommend often. It's the book by John Walvoord called Every Prophecy of the Bible. And you'll read through that and you'll see the short-term prophecies that God has already fulfilled and the long-term prophecies yet to come and it does nothing but grow the intensity of your faith as you see God's prophetic track record coming into existence. Charles Ryrie says this, in the interpretation of unfulfilled prophecy, fulfilled prophecy forms the pattern. The logical way to discover how God will fulfill prophecy in the future is to discover how he fulfilled prophecy in the past. If hundreds of prophecies concerning Christ's first coming were fulfilled literally, as is going to be the case with Joseph, how can anyone reject the literal fulfillment of the numerous prophecies concerning his second coming and reign on the earth? We teach a, a model of prophecy here. That there's coming a rapture. You ready for that? Followed by that will be the tribulation period. Then after that will be the second advent of Christ. And then after that will be the thousand year kingdom. Then after that will be the great white throne judgment. And after that will be the eternal state. And you say, well, pastor, you keep teaching these things as if, as if this is dogmatically true. Why do you do that? Because I see the pattern of God in the past. God always fulfills his word verbatim. It's going to happen in Joseph's life. So why wouldn't the prophecies yet to come be fulfilled in the exact same way? The basis of our belief system is, number one there, the consistent use of the plain, normal, literal, 
grammatical, historical method of interpretation. Because we can see prophecy coming to pass, literally, it gives us confidence of the prophecies yet to come. So this is the content of Joseph's dream. And then you go down to verse 8 and you see the reaction of the brothers. Now this reaction is interesting because in the reaction, the prophecy of the sheaves, one sheaf rising up and the other sheaves bowing down, is explained. So you'll notice that I'm not relying upon my own sanctified imagination to interpret verse 7. All I have to do is read verse 8. Notice, if you will, verse 8, it says, Then his brothers said to him, now they're going to rebuke him. And in the process of the rebuke, they're going to explain the prophecy in verse 7. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams. This is the nature of understanding prophecies in the Bible. I don't have to come in with my own sanctified imagination in verse 7 when verse 8 is going to interpret the prophecy for me. It's the same, by the way, in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation uses tons of symbols. Yet 26 times the immediate context, according to Dr. John Walvoord, will interpret the symbols for you. So the Bible is its own uh, best interpreter. And so what happens in the processes of this rebuke is the brothers actually explain the prophecy. The sheaf standing upright is Joseph, speaking of his authority that he will have. And how the 11, Joseph being the 12th, the 11 will actually submit to his authority one day in Egypt. And once again, that's a prophecy that's going to happen with absolute precision. It's just a matter of time. It's going to take God 13 years to fulfill this prophecy. If God says something, it will happen even if it looks impossible. This probably looked ridiculous to Joseph and Joseph's brothers. But given enough time, God always fulfills his word. If he doesn't, then his character can be attacked as being dishonest. Do do you realize that in Islam and Islamic thought, Allah the God of Islam is a deceiver who may go back on his word. This is why Muslims have no assurance of their eternity because they're told that their good works have to outweigh their bad works. That's quite a subjective standard. How do you know if you're making progress? And then even if your good works outweigh your bad works, Allah, the deceiver, can yank the carpet out from under you in the final judgment because he's a deceiver. Do you realize how different that worldview is compared to the God of the Bible, the God of Scripture, who always means what he says and says what he means, and his word always has to happen. If it doesn't happen exactly like he says, then his character is at stake as an untrustworthy God, and yet it is impossible, Hebrews 6 verse 18 says, for God to lie. This, by the way, is one of the reasons we should be people of truth, because we're following the God of truth. We should not be deceptive and underhanded and liars in our personal dealings because after all who are we serving we're serving the God of the universe who cannot lie and one of the things he's promised you John 5 24 is if you put your faith in his son for your salvation that you have eternal life and you've already passed from death unto life Paul in Romans 8, 29 and 30 indicates that 
our salvation is so sure, it's so secure that he can speak of our glorification as if it's already happened. Do you realize that as a Christian, you're already glorified? Now I'm looking at it, you, you guys don't look very glorified. <laughs> I doubt I look very glorified. But God says it's a done deal. He can talk about it as if it's already happened. Because God means what he says and says what he means. And Joseph, whether he understood, and the brothers, whether they understood how this prophecy was going to be fulfilled, are going to get a lesson that it's going to be fulfilled. In fact, it's very interesting. The more the brothers fought against this prophecy, the more they were expediting the fulfillment of the prophecy. Hey, let's, let's take this guy and throw him into a pit. Well, that's not working so well. Let's sell him as a slave down into Egypt. We'll get rid of him that way. When, as the moment they sold him as a slave down into Egypt, is the moment they were greasing the wheels <laughs> towards the fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, this is why God says to Saul before he was saved, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads? Why, why do you fight my plan? Don't you know you can't fight God? And in fact, the more you try to fight God, the more you're actually being used by God to expedite what he wants to do. That's how sure the prophetic word is. And this was happening with Joseph. But his brothers hated him. They hated him even more, second part of the verse, for his dreams and his word. We hate your dreams and quit talking about it. Quit saying things like to us like, Shema, listen up. We don't want to hear it. I'm of the persuasion that the brothers may have believed these dreams were true, but they were so jealous of him, they tried to stop the, the, the dreams from materializing. And that's the circumstance that Joseph is in. He is experiencing opposition from the world system, much like the opposition we normally face as Christians. And then you go down to verses 9 through 11, and here comes dream number 2. Look at verse 9. We have the dream, Jacob's response, and then responses. Notice the dream, Genesis 37, verse 9. Now he had still another dream and related, to, related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, now we're not dealing with sheaves anymore, we're dealing with stars. Each sheaf would represent one of the brothers, Joseph being the erect, the sheaf standing up, the erect 12th, they're bowing down to him. Now the same concept is narrated in the form of sun, moon, and stars. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers. See the naivety there? Casting pearls before swine. And said, lo, I still have had another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. Notice this expression here, another dream. In fact, it says that twice in verse 9. Why, why did God give him two dreams? I mean, isn't one dream sufficient? Well, the answer relates to an ancient principle of God about a matter needing to be confirmed by two to three witnesses. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, regarding execution of criminals under the Mosaic law, it says, on the evidence of of two witnesses or three witnesses, he shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Paul in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 says, this is my third time coming to you, Corinthians. And Paul states this ancient principle. He says, this is the, first, the third time I'm coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
How about removing an elder from a position within a local church? How many witnesses do you have? One guy says, I saw the elder in sin. That's not sufficient to remove an elder. You've got to have two to three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 19 says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Why would God give Joseph two dreams? Because this is his life. This is what he has to cling to in the midst of adversity. So God gives him the minimum requirement. Maybe he gave him more for all I know, but two to three witnesses. Not one dream, but two. Now, when I started to move in the direction of ministry, that was a pretty big shift for me. I was involved in a completely different career, and I had to have it confirmed. One confirmation wasn't enough. And I asked the Lord at that time, Lord, if this is of you, I need to really know it's true. I need you to confirm this. Now, you can confirm it how you want. I'm not going to tell you how to confirm it. You can confirm it through people. You can confirm it through circumstances. God has all kinds of tools at his disposal that he'll use in your life. And I had that confirmed over and over and over again. He didn't just give me two to three witnesses, maybe because I'm a little stubborn and slow. He gave me multiple witnesses. If you feel God is leading you to make some kind of drastic life change, ask God for confirmation. God is not insulted by that. He's, he, he is the author of the two to three witnesses idea. He is the author of the two to three witnesses concept. By the way, very, very sadly in the body of Christ, people will pull this number on you. Hey, God told me to tell you. <laughs> I guess you guys have been hit with that one. To stop wearing red ties on Sunday or whatever. Sadly, I've heard of situations in missions groups where a young man wants to marry a young woman. They're both Christians, and he comes up to her and says, you know, God told me to tell you that you're my wife. The answer to that is, well, God hasn't told me that. <laughs> and if this is of God, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. I'm going to wait on the Lord. Well, you don't have enough faith. No, no, you don't understand. There's an ancient principle at work here. Let a matter be confirmed by two to three witnesses. There is absolutely no shame in asking God to confirm something that you think could be of God and might be of God. And I think this is the reason why Joseph has these two to three witnesses. But at any rate, this time around, he sees the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars, Joseph being the 12th star, bowing down to him. Now here comes a rebuke, just like the brothers rebuked Joseph about the first dream, and in the process of the rebuke, interpreted the imagery, uh, so I'm not left to my sanctified imagination. The same thing is now happening as Jacob, the father, learns of this dream. It says in verse 10, he related it to his father and to his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream you have had? Shall I, that's the sun, your mother, that's the moon, and your brothers, that's the 11 stars, actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? That's star number 12. Who is the sun, S-U-N, Jacob? Who's the moon? Well, it can't be Rachel because Rachel already died. Rachel's death we have studied and it's been recorded for us in Genesis 35 16 through 18. But Jacob had another wife. Maybe the, the moon is Leah. That's a possibility. Others would say, no, uh, Rachel was given a handmaiden named, uh, let's see, her name is Billa. Maybe the moon is Billa. So at any rate, we're not completely sure. It's either Leah or it's, it's Billa. 
but she is the matriarch uh, of the nation of Israel. So the sun, S-U-N, is Jacob. The moon could be Leah or Billah. The 11 stars are Joseph's brother. The 12 star is Joseph. And so these are the 12 tribes of Israel. You say, well, pastor, you're always looking for excuses to turn to the book of Revelation. (laughs) And I plead guilty. If you understand this prophecy and the reference, you'll understand Revelation 12, verses 1 through 5. It says there, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a a crown of 12 stars. Does that sound familiar? And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor, pain, to give birth. And another sign was seen in heaven, and behold, the great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head seven diadems, and his tail swept a third of the stars out of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he may devour her child. She gave birth to a son a male child who was to rule all of the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God in his throne. Some of the most intense symbolic imagery in the book of Revelation in the whole book. You have a son, S-O-N, a dragon, and a woman. Now, the Bible, when it talks, it's either talking in one of two languages, plain literal or figurative language. Those are the only two ways communication can take place. It's either talking in the form of something absolutely plain or literal or something symbolic. And if it's symbolic, the symbol refers to something. It's like my wife this morning. She says, how did you sleep? I said, great. I slept until 8 a.m., And I slept like a log. And she doesn't say, well, did you turn into a piece of wood last night? I mean, our name is Woods, so that would, that would fit. When I say like, I've shifted from 8 a.m. to a, a symbol that represents something. And this happens in language constantly. Sometimes you can get them confused, though. One time my wife said to me, your cup is running over. I had put a cup of coffee in the microwave and forgot to turn it off. And she, I forgot it was turned off and I was in another part of the house. She says, your cup is running over. And I said, yeah, you're right. I am blessed in this life. And <laughs> <laughs> My cup is running over. She says, no, your cup is running over. So she was speaking plainly and I interpreted it figuratively. But in Scripture, what you'll find are clues that tell you when figurative language is employed. Did you see the word sign in Revelation 12? A great sign, that's the Greek word simeon. It's repeated in verse 3. So we know we're dealing with symbolic imagery. And when you run into symbolic imagery in the book of Revelation, there are two basic rules to follow. This is not rocket science. There There are ways to understand what these symbols mean. The first way to understand it is you have to examine the immediate context because a lot of times the symbol will be interpreted for you right there in the context. And if that doesn't work, search the Old Testament. The book of Revelation has 404 verses in it, 278 are allusions to the Old Testament. So following these simple rules, the Son, S-O-N, is Jesus. Psalm 2, verse 9 makes that clear. The dragon is the devil. You keep reading Revelation 12 and you'll see that. Now who is the woman? This woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. The Roman Catholic Church will tell you that the woman is the Virgin Mary. There are many, many people out there that will tell you that the church will not be removed from the tribulation period. 
In fact, the church is going into the tribulation period. And you say, well, show me a reference to the church in the tribulation period, and they believe that this woman is the church. That doesn't work. The woman is giving birth to Jesus. See that? The church did not give birth to Jesus. It's the other way around. Jesus gave birth to the church. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, I say to you, are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The woman giving birth to the Messiah cannot be the church because the church did not give birth to Jesus. Jesus gave birth to the church. You follow that? I think it was Wellington Boone that preached a famous sermon, Your Wife Ain't Your Mama. Okay. This... I was actually going to name this sermon, Your Wife Ain't Your Mama, but this is not dealing with the bride of Christ. This is dealing with the mother of Christ. So, so the woman is not the Virgin Mary. The woman is not the church. All you have to do is follow the imagery back to Joseph's dream, and I can do that because Revelation has a ton of verses in it that allude to the Old Testament. The woman is none other than the nation of Israel. See how easy this is? It's a picture of the the devil, dragon, standing in front of the woman, or Israel, the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars, patriarch of Israel, matriarch of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel, trying to stop the birth of Jesus. If you're interested in how Satan tried to do that, we dealt with that in our Christmas message the 24th of December last year. Henry Morris writes this concerning the book of Revelation. It must be stressed that Revelation means unveiling and not veiling. God did not give us the book of Revelation to confuse us. The whole point of the book is a disclosure. That's the very name of the book. In fact, the title of it comes from the first word in the book. Apocalypsis, meaning disclosure. God did not veil his truth so only the elite could understand it. Understanding these simple principles allows you to unlock the meaning of the book of Revelation. It's Satan trying to stop the birth of Jesus coming through Israel. And you know that that woman is Israel through which the Messiah is going to be born because the same imagery that's used of her, sun, moon, and 12 stars, is first used in Joseph's dream concerning the nation of Israel. So Joseph has this vision. It's given in two dreams that there's coming a time in his life where the patriarch of Israel, the matriarch of Israel, the 11 brothers through which are going to come various tribes are going to submit to his authority. And this will happen in your lifetime. Hindsight is 2020. We know it happened uh, 13 years later. Hang on to this vision, Joseph. Because as the pilot says, you're about to encounter turbulence. And the only thing that's going to keep you sane in the midst of turbulence is the vision that God has given you for your life. The power of, of a vision from God. The power of what he wants to do. That, you know, I've seen all kinds of statistics and studies of people who quit the ministry. And it's easy to want to quit because it's not always fun and roses. But the statistics that I've seen indicate that the guys that stick it out or gals that stick it out have some sort of vision or calling for what God wants to do through them. And it just keeps them hanging on when you encounter a little bit of turbulence. Or in the case of Joseph, a lot of turbulence. Ask the Lord for what he wants to do with your life. That's that's, what's going to keep you sane in the midst of difficulty. 
we come to the very end here, verse 11, the, the reactions, and you have the reactions of the brothers, verse 11. It says his brothers were jealous of him. You know, jealousy is something you have to face. When God uses your life, other people get jealous. When God prospers you in any sense, financially, spiritually, you have an understanding that maybe others don't share, there will be jealousy. And we want to guard ourselves from the sin of jealousy and be jealous of other people when God uses them. But every time God starts to move, every time God starts to work, there's jealousy constantly in the Bible. Acts 5, verse 17, concerning the apostles, studying the book of Acts on Wednesday night, but the high priest rose up along with all his associates, and they were filled with jealousy. Acts 13, 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began con contradicting the things spoken of by Paul. How about Daniel? He's moving up the ranks there in Persia. It says in Daniel 6, verse 3, then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. What do the rest of the administrators in Persia do? Then, Daniel 6, verse 4, the commissioners and the satraps began trying to, a way to find accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could not find ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Once Daniel starts to distinguish himself to a lead role in Persia, they started to see if there's any skeletons in the closet. We've got to bring this guy down. It's like the proverbial crab crying, climbing out of the pot. The other crabs don't like it, and they try to pull this successful crab down. Um, this is an unfortunate reality. I, I wish it wasn't this way, but it happens. So when it happens in your life, don't be surprised by it. But here's the thing that's interesting. God will actually use the jealousy of other people in your life to expedite his plan. Because this plan is going to happen. God said it's going to happen. And you can be jealous and you can come against it all you want. And in fact, the more you actually come against it, the more you're putting sort of oil in the wheel to make the wheel run smoother. That's the power of God. He even uses opposition as one of his tools to get things moving along. So don't be shocked when jealousy comes your way. And then the other thing is, if God is blessing using someone, don't be jealous of him. You don't want to be like that. You want to just say, praise the Lord. We're, we're, we're all on the same team here. One fast thing here with Jacob's reaction, because Jacob, the dad, has a little different understanding than do the brothers who just hated Joseph. It says his brothers were jealous of him, but his father, that's Jacob, kept the, say, kept the saying in mind. Jacob sort of rebukes Joseph, verse 10, but as he's learning more and more about it, he doesn't overtly re, uh, rebuke what God has alleged, allegedly given to Joseph. He just says, let me, as the saying goes, let me noodle that, noodle on that for a little while. Let me ruminate on it, because it might be true. The word that's used in Hebrew to describe rumination is selah. In fact, as you're going through the book of Proverbs, you'll see at the end of many of the Proverbs, selah, which means consider carefully. 
That's what we need to do with a lot of circumstances. We sometimes rush in as judges, but maybe God is saying, Selah, ruminate, noodle on it, consider it. Don't overtly reject it out of jealousy. Reminds me of Mary, remember? When she learned that her womb was going to be the vehicle of the Holy Spirit to bring forth the Messiah into the world. It says in Luke 2.19, but Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. It reminds me of Gamaliel, who told the rest of the Sadducees concerning the birth of the church, let's hold off judgment for a while, because this might be of God. We don't know yet. Acts 5, 38 and 39, so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men, let them alone, for if this is the plan or action is of men, it will, it will be overthrown. But if it, is, if, it is, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. So that's Jacob's mindset. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. The brothers, it was completely different. Rejection, jealousy, hatred. Concerning an instruction to us, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, therefore do not go on passing judgment before the appointed time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. I have made, one of the major mistakes I've made in my life is judging people and judging circumstances and judging things prematurely. Someone steps out to be used by God, ah, God will never use that person. Look at that person's background. God God would never use a person like that. Now, a person like me, of course he would use, right? We We think that way, forgetting our own sin. Only to discover down the road that God is using that person to accomplish eternal things. And then you say to yourself, well, Lord, I sure look like a fool, where I prematurely judged a situation. There's there's a lot of things that happen in life and God is just saying, don't evaluate immediately out of the gate. Just wait. Because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. And that's more the attitude of Jacob. And that's the mindset that that we're to have. So Joseph's coat, Joseph's dreams. Next week, Joseph's pit. Verses 12 through 24 for next week. If you wanted to read ahead. And speaking of a pit, did you know that Jesus died to keep you out of a pit? And that pit is called hell, which is eternal separation from God. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, stepped out of eternity into time to absorb the wrath of a holy God in our place. His final words were, it is finished, meaning everything that's necessary to keep us out of the pit of of hell has been accomplished. And he asks us to trust not in our own good works, but the good work he did for us 2,000 years ago. If there's anyone within the sound of my voice that is unclear about their salvation, our exhortation to you is in your heart of hearts as the Spirit places you under conviction to place your personal faith, which just means trust, reliance, dependence, confidence for your eternity and the safekeeping of your soul exclusively into the God-man Jesus and his finished transaction. And once you do that, just like that, you're a newborn child of God. This is not a 12-step program, it's a one-step program It does not involve walking an aisle, raising a hand, joining a church, giving money, New Year's resolutions. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with placing the object, the content, 
of your faith in the right place, which is Jesus and Jesus alone. If anyone's unclear on that ultimate decision, which keeps us out of the pit, praise the Lord, I would encourage you to come talk to me afterward. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the power of vision, what you gave to Joseph early through these two dreams. We're thankful that you're a God of veracity and truthfulness. You're not here to deceive us. Help us to continue to understand these great truths about your character and your nature as we continue through the book of Genesis. Help us to walk these things out this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.